Hey everyone, next week LUServe is hosting Foster the Future, a forum all about how you can get involved in helping at-risk kids and youth and minimize the need for foster care. During this discussion, you will hear from some leading practitioners and discover tangible ways to engage and serve. If you feel led to serve in this area, join us in the Science Building, room 128 on Thursday, April 11th from 5 to 6.30 p.m. We'll see you there. My name is Justin. I'm Daisy. And I'm Caroline. And we hope you had a good and restful Easter break. And guys, this weekend is CFA, and if you're anything like me, then you'll probably get mistaken for a CFA. Right, I'm a junior and it still happens. But we have a lot of events for you guys this week, so stay tuned. Not me. All right, guys, guys, guys. I have another pitch. Mm -hmm. Picture this, a bouncy house in the middle of campus. So if you need a study break, you can say, let's bounce. You know, I don't really know about that, Daisy, but if you do have a good idea, then come on out to the Create Fest on April 5th from 6 to 9 this Friday. Yes, come watch as they compete for a $10,000 prize. Right, bring your best. Guys, Unified Korea is also hosting an event on April 5th at 6 p.m. in DeMoss 1286. Yes, and this will be the Dean of Liberty School of Law, Morris Tan. Join him for a great discussion about what God is doing in North and South Korea. LU1's K-pop event is also coming this weekend. Yes, this will be on April 5th from 9 to 11.30 in the La Haye event space. This is gonna be a time of fun celebration of Korean culture. Don't miss this. Hello, student activities table. Hey, Justin. Who is going to be giving a concert on April 5th at 8 p.m.? Chris Renzema. Where's the concert gonna be? The Vine Center. Are tickets still available? I would say so. Where can we get tickets? At liberty.edu slash concerts. See you there. We all know how much Daisy loves men's lacrosse. Well, we're not going to make it weird, but we do hope to see you at the men's lacrosse game at 7 p.m. against Concordia. So. We'll see you there. Yeah. She'll be there. Okay. Caroline, what did you want to be when you grew up? Um, I think a doctor. Hey, Justin, what about you? I always wanted to be the host of New at LU. Well, that's very nice. Um, I've always wanted to be representing a school as some sort of bird but not just any bird, Sparky. And if you would also like to represent our school as Sparky, tryouts are this weekend on April 5th and 6th. Bring it on home, John B. Bring it on home. My goal is to have a good time all the time. If this sounds familiar for all you Outer Banks fans, then you need to check out Grant Holiday's new film that features Deputy Stoop from Outer Banks. Yes, support one of your very own and check this out. You're telling me there's nothing else we can do. The curtain is drawn. How far we have fallen. I'm out on the run. Hi. I just want to know what's going on in here. I'm trying to save him. It's dark from the outside. I'm not fine. Mine's a damn. Marcelo! 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 You aiming for his heart? Should I not have? He's got maybe two hours. He's gonna suffer every minute of it. 
Guys, the Seda Spring Market is going to be happening from April 5th to the 12th from 4 to 7 p.m. each day in green 1350. There's gonna be lots of cool art for sale there. We hope to see you there. And that's all that's new. Enjoy your day at LU. God has called you to be extraordinary. Am I the whole picture or a piece of the collage? Am I a whole piece or a piece of a pawn? Am I another beast that could be picked apart? Will I ever do a Millie with Quezon? Will my mama open the salon? Will anybody listen to the song? Of course they will. Quezon, sing along. Uh. Coach you mill on my flight to Milan. Uh. When you see me, don't be scared. Tap my arm. Uh. Walk with me, talk with me, sing a song. Yeah, walk with me, talk with me. We are all here for a reason. And this season ain't gon' kill me. God gon' heal me. Head to the sky, dog. Well, life gets filthy. Life gets crazy. My God trippy, bro. See, life just don't play fair. I guess it's fair enough. But it broke my heart in half. Say la da, la da da da, by my heart break. Say la da, la da, my love lost. Who am I? Who am I? Yo, without the Spotify. Who am I? Who am I? Zephaniah never, never died. died. Who am I? Who am I? Khaled or Messiah. No son or a father. Father or, father father or, father or God. God. Am I real? Am I fake? Fake or a mirage? Am I a whole picture or a piece of the collage? Am I a whole piece or a piece of a pond? Am I another beast that could be picked apart? Will I ever do a Millie with K? Son. He's near to the broken heart. Cause he is faithful when you're fearful. He is faithful when you're strong. He gives rest to all the weary. He's your father, your son. Don't give up what you've begun. You are loved, you are loved. 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 You are loved. You are love, you are love. And Father God, I want to thank you for blessing me and my wife with a wonderful son, Zephaniah Josiah. And I thank you for your resurrection because of what you did on the cross. And when you rose up out of that grave, I know my son will do the same thing. So right now I lift up all my brothers and sisters in here who have lost somebody and that loss has caused them to question their identity. Lord, we're just asking for your grace and mercy that you would be with them. You said you are near to the brokenhearted. You said, blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. And we believe that. We believe in your resurrection, and we believe in your Holy Spirit to give us comfort in those times. Thank you for giving us such a great community here. I pray those people wouldn't isolate themselves. I pray for your strength, Lord, that you would show up in a way that they've never seen you before. In the mighty, mighty, mighty name of Jesus, amen. Check it out.
Obviously, those are scenes from what took place last week in our 24 hours of day of prayer. The second one of this semester, there's another coming up in a couple of weeks after our last campus community. We're going to have an overnight time of prayer as well. And the reason we're doing this is because we, we firmly believe in the power of prayer. In fact, next Wednesday night at campus community, we'll be in 1 John chapter 5, the last part of that passage, and where it tells us in that passage that anything that we ask in the will of God, in the name of Jesus, that God hears us and he will do it. And so we recognize and understand we live in a world today that is full of conflict, full of challenge, and we, the body of Christ, we need to be focused in, we need to be leaning into the power of prayer. And so we want that to be a regular rhythm here at Liberty University. In fact, as we're moving forward and building new facilities here, we're actually building a larger prayer gathering room that will be open 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year where not only students, faculty, and staff here on this campus, but our online students around the world will have the opportunity through streaming technology to actually join with us in prayer. That we want the Liberty University community, over 150,000 strong, to constantly be in prayer. Not only for what is happening here, but for what God is going to do through us out there. And we've got a couple of weeks, April 27th, we have our Serve Lynchburg Day. And this is an opportunity for us to take what God is doing in our hearts and take it out to our community right here in Lynchburg. We've got over 1,600 spots for students to be plugged in, over 100 organizations we're going to be working with that day on that Saturday from 10 until about 6 p.m. And then after that, we're going to have the opportunity for the block party celebration of what God has done in that day. And so we need you to join with us on April 27th. The information's right there on the screen. Just shoot that QR code to get the information, sign up. We need 1,600 of you. It's the most spots that we've ever had. Last year, I think we had about 1,100, 1,200. We've increased it now to 1,600 opportunities for all of the students to be involved. So find a place, find a time, be a part of it, and let's use this as an opportunity of taking what God is doing in our lives here in this room and take it out to a community that desperately needs to know that Jesus is alive, that he died and rose again for them. And let's pray that the power of the gospel is emanating throughout this community as a result of the Liberty University community serving right here in Lynchburg. So let's get to our feet. Let's worship together here this morning. Shit! 
What's up, Liberty? My name's Preston Perry, and right now you're about to have the privilege of hearing from my wife, Jackie Hill Perry. And I say it's a privilege because it is. We all know Jackie is tremendously gifted. Anybody can see that, right? She's a great communicator of the gospel, a great teacher, a great author, a great poet, a great MC. Um, she has like 90 gifts. <laughs> uh, but, I, but I'm honored to say that with all that, she's a greater mother. She's a greater wife to me. Um, I love Jackie so much because um, she is the woman that she that she that she presents on social media. There isn't no phoniness about her, no pretense, um, and she just pursues the Lord with everything that she has. Um, I, I've adored her um, from the moment that I met her when we was poets back in the day, and I respect and honor her even more now um, because she loves the Lord and she loves His people. And so, man, um, she's, a, she's a true gem, not just because of her gifts, but because of who she is. She belongs to the Lord, and the Lord hand is on her. So obvious. And so my only job as a husband is to make sure she flies how she can, you know? Uh, not my only job, but one of my jobs. And so y'all watch my wife fly today. Um, enjoy her, and I hope she enjoys you guys. I, I believe she will. And uh, surprise, baby, I love you. Um, yeah, y'all take care of my baby, Jackie Hill Perry. Peace. Um, that was very cute, Liberty. That was, that was sweet. If I was a little lighter skinned, I would have blushed. How are you? Are you okay? You good? Okay. Um, so my name is Jackie. I live in Atlanta with a guy that just spoke very highly of me um, and our four children. I have, a, I have stretch marks. Um, I have a bad attitude sometimes. I'm a bit introverted. I have great hair and eyebrows, and I'm here to teach the text. You know, you should affirm yourself. You shouldn't hate yourself, you know. Um, I'm going to get straight to it. Uh, uh, if, you, if you had a black mama, make some noise. It's more than I expected. <laughs> See, black mamas deserve their flowers for many things. But one particular gift that black mamas have given us is a catalog of phrases that are both parabolic and comedic. Let's say, hypothetically speaking, you know, after school, you go down the street to play, you know, something with your friends or whatever. And if it's winter time, you could come in the house and your mama not gonna say nothing. But let it be about 68 degrees and up. As soon as you come in that house, a black mama ain't gonna say hi. She's gonna say, hey, I'm gonna need you to get in the bath because you smell like outside. What does outside smell like exactly? It smells exactly like outside. Black mamas also use sayings that if you, you really think about it, the construction of the saying doesn't make sense. They say, they say stuff like, fix your face. How do I fix my face or watch your mouth? How do my eyes watch my, like you, it doesn't make sense, but you know exactly what they mean by it. One of my favorite phrases of black mamas is actually multi-ethnic. So I think all of us can relate to this one. Um, it's when you wanna do something dumb with your friends and you give your mama the itinerary, and your mama says something like, if all of your friends jumped off a cliff, you do it too, huh? I like that one. I like that one because it'll preach, not 
not just to my kids or, or to your kids, but I think that phrase will actually preach to the church because we have preachers jumping off cliffs left and right. We, we have preachers inviting carnality into the sanctuary of God, plot twist. We have preachers preaching messages that have absolutely nothing to do with Jesus and everything to do with you. We, we have so-called prophets. We have prophets giving people demons in the name of deliverance. We have Christians. We have Christians who don't know how to read their Bibles. We have Christians who don't know how to pray without ceasing. We have Christians that don't know how to take up their cross and die daily, and they don't know because they're not being discipled and what it looks like to love God with all of their heart and with all of their mind and with all of their soul. And I am here to tell you that just because everybody is acting crazy, just because everybody is jumping off the cliff, you don't have to. Because... You ain't got to clap, just receive, just receive. Be because if, if you see the popularity of liars, the easy Christianity of the lukewarm, the synchronistic tone of the culture, the apathetic leadership of the weary, if you see that and envy it, you will want to jump. And if you do, for a short while, it'll feel like you're flying. It'll feel like you are free. But I can promise you, according to the word, that it won't be long before your body hits the ground. The text before us is not written by a black mama, but by a spiritual father to a spiritual son. Like us, Timothy is doing ministry in what feels like an impossible environment. There is false teaching and immorality all around him, and not just in the world, but in the church. The apostle Paul writes this letter, 2 Timothy to Timothy, while in prison before he's about to die. And in it, he is instructing Timothy, his son in the faith, that even if every person around you jumps off the cliff because they think it will help them fly, since you know the truth, you can and you must stay standing on solid ground. Let's pray. God, we thank you. We thank you that you are worthy to be praised. We thank you that you are worthy to be honored. We thank you that you are worthy to be known. We thank you that you are worthy to be believed and trusted. We pray that you will pour out your spirit, that we would receive your truth, that we would receive your admonishment, that we would receive your correction and your discipline, but I also pray that we would receive your, your affirmation, God. I pray that we who love you for real will know that you are well pleased because we are in Christ Jesus. So please help us to stay sane, help us to stay sober, help us to endure suffering, help us to do the work of an evangelist and help us to fulfill our ministry. Help us, in Jesus' name, amen. If you have your Bibles, which you should because you're at liberty, turn to 2 Timothy chapter four. Say amen when you got it. I come from a country called Black Church, by the way. Uh, and, and black church, the, the language and the dialect of that country uh, means that we, we, we're a bit aggressive, okay? So if you think I'm angry with you, I ain't mad at you. I'm just passionate. Look at verse one. I charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead, and by his appearing in his kingdom, preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, and exhort with complete patience and teaching. For the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching, but having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions. They will turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into myths. As for you, always be sober-minded, endure suffering, do the work of an evangelist, Fulfill your ministry. The title of this, of this message is, But As For You. The direct, direct context of this letter is that the Apostle Paul is writing to his spiritual son, instructing him in pastoral ministry. Some of us might be pastors. Most of us probably aren't. And so there are some of us who can relate specifically to Paul's instructions. 
Those of us who are not pastors, we might be preachers, we might be teachers, we might be disciple makers, we might be Bible study uh, group leaders, we might be influencers, mothers, fathers, grandparents, uncles, aunties. So the way I'm going to apply, apply Paul's instructions to Timothy is that I'm going to apply it in the broadest sense, meaning this message is for every Christian who actually wants to make disciples. When we get to chapter 4, Paul has just told Timothy to continue and what he has learned from childhood, namely as it relates to his acquaintance with the scriptures. Paul goes on to describe the nature of scripture as being God-breathed and profitable for all the things. After that, he says this, verse 1, I charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead, and by his appearing and his kingdom, preach the word. That's my first point, by the way. It's that in whatever ministry God has entrusted to you, preach the word. And notice, Paul did not say preach a word, as if Timothy has options, as, as if he can pick and choose what it is that he's supposed to communicate. Paul has already told Timothy what word he is supposed to preach. In chapter 1, Paul says that this word is a good deposit that was entrusted to him by God. In chapter 2, Paul says that he is imprisoned and in chains, but because this word is of God, it is therefore not bound in chains. In the same chapter, Paul says that this word is the word of truth, which must be handled rightly. And in chapter 3, he told us that this word is breathed out by God. So, so when Paul says, preach the word, he clearly means that word that good deposit word, that word of God, that word of truth, that, that spirit breathed word. And do you know that the reason that the word even exists in the first place is because God wants you to know him? There's this thing called the creator-creature distinction, which basically says that God is God and you ain't. God as God means he is eternal, omniscient, omnipotent, holy, transcendent, and invisible. You as creature are bound to time, are finite, are human. And therefore, how can you as the creature know anything about an invisible and transcendent God if this God doesn't decide to tell you? Somebody might say, Jackie, doesn't Romans 1 say that God can be known through creation? So, so we don't necessarily need the Bible to learn about God if we got the stars and we got the moon, we got the mountains, we even got ourselves. And I would respond by saying, it's always funny to me when people use the Bible to undermine the Bible. The only reason you know that the creation preaches is because the Bible told you that. Secondly, by looking at creation, Somebody would come to the conclusion that somebody divine had to make all of this. The creation is able to preach that there is a God, but the creation cannot tell you which God it is. Therefore, even creation is an insufficient source of revelation. But do you know what is? Do, do you know what is sufficient? The scriptures, the first sentence of it, Genesis 1 says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And, and do you know how he did it, saints? He, he, he did it with a word. He, he merely said, let there be, and there, there was. And this God doesn't just make worlds with words. He, he reveals himself to his creatures in it with words to Abram, to Isaac, to Jacob, to Moses. He communicated with him that his name and his law and his promises using language. Eventually, eventually the second person of the triune God, Jesus, takes on flesh, revealing God. And do you know how the scriptures describe him? Do you know what they called him? They said that he was the word. John said, in the beginning was the word and the word was God and the word became God and the word became flesh and he didn't become God. The word became flesh and dwelt among us. And it is by looking at Jesus in the scriptures that the God of creation is revealed. So the mountains might have a sermon, but it is never as sufficient as the scriptures, which gives us all that we need to know about God on this side of heaven. So then if we want to know God, if we want to love God, if we want to see God, if we want to understand God, if we want to worship God, if we want to have context for God, if we want to have faith in God, we have to know our Bibles. It's simple. There, there is no legitimate knowledge of God that one can have 
without God's self-revelation. Since God wants to be known by you, he accommodates himself by communicating with you in a way that you can understand. What a kindness. What a kindness that God's self-disclosure is written down. Once on tablets of stone, then on scrolls that became a book, and being similar to Jesus who is the word, the written word is also human and divine. And it is not so human that it lacks divine authority. And it is not so divine that it lacks human personality and experience. This book that is, that is written, this book that we teach from, this book that we are reading is written with human hands and the product of the breath of God. What a kindness that God's revelation is contained in a piece of literature that is in fact sacred and true and God-breathed and authoritative and profitable and closed and therefore we may not add to it or take away. What a kindness that God's revelation gives us 800,000 words and seven different genres with 40 different authors written over 1,500 years, which is able, as Paul says, to make you wise unto salvation. What other word do you think you're supposed to preach if not that one? I'm here to tell you, if, if you are out here doing ministry with the intention of preaching a word, but not the word, please sit down and go home somewhere. Because if your word didn't make me, then your word surely can't save me. If we want to see a revival happen in this generation, we, we don't need new methods and we don't need new words. We simply need to return to the means of grace that God has already promised to bless, which is the faithful preaching of the word. Paul tells Timothy, preach the word. Why? Look at verse two, three. For the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching, but having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions. They will turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into myths. Paul has already talked to Timothy about the subject of time. In chapter 3, he said, In the last days, there will come times of difficulty. In the last days, the difficulty will be so because people will be lovers. If you're familiar with the text, you know that Paul means more than that. He, he describes all kinds of different sins. He says in the, the last days, people will be proud. They will be arrogant. They will be abusive. And, and all of those traits are an expression of love. So it seems that one commentator put it that the entire list that Paul gives in chapter 3 is a reaction to people basically being inherently lovers of self. From this love of self, which is an inordinate, self-centered, narcissistic kind of preoccupation that we all have with ourselves that we're born with. I don't know if you've ever seen a two-year-old. They're the most arrogant beings I've ever seen in my life. Paul is saying that in the last days, that's how we don't be. That's how we function. He also says that people will not just be lovers of themselves, but they'll be lovers of pleasure and lovers of money. What shocked me when I really paid attention to this entire section is that these people who love themselves more than God, who love money, who love pleasure, are also people who have a form of godliness. I used to read that text and think Paul was doing the same thing he did in Romans 1. I thought he was talking about the Gentiles. I, I thought he was talking about people in the world, but he's actually saying that the lovers of self and the lovers of money, and the, no, those are people in the church. Those are some of y'all, which tells me that there are people among us People in our congregations, people in our pulpits, people in our friend groups, people in our churches who talk like Christians, who walk like Christians. But the, the true church is being hoodwinked. We are being bamboozled. We are being led astray and flat out the sea because their godliness is a form. It's a public appearance with no inner reality. These people who have a form of godliness are not Christians. They have not been converted. They have not been given the eyes to see and the ears to hear. They, they still have a heart of stone. 
They are whitewashed tombs. They are still dead in their trespasses and sins. They are still in the kingdom of darkness. Even if they, even if they serve in your ministries, they are still slaves to sin, but they have a form of godliness that makes it seem as if they belong with the sheep. But because they deny the power that can make their confession sincere, they relegate themselves to the position of a wolf that just wears the sheep's clothing. And I think, I think most people with a form of godliness don't even know that that's their true identity. Because we tend to believe that every false convert and every wolf, that they know they're a wolf. But that would take a level of self-awareness that blind people don't actually have apart from divine revelation. Paul says it's when we correct our opponents with, with gentleness and respect, it is God that may grant them repentance, leading to a knowledge and understanding and awareness of clarity on truth. Remember Paul writing this letter, he was attempting to destroy God's church and was persuaded that his evil was actually God's will for his life. This Paul said in chapter 3, that evil people will go on from bad to worse, deceiving and being these, deceive these people who love themselves, these people who love money, these people who love pleasure. They, they don't know God and they don't even know that. So they are just as deceived as the people they are leading. It is in fact the blind leading the blind. And the reason I bring this up is because what kind of people do you think folks with itching ears are listening to? What kind of category, what, what kind of nature, what, what kind of heart, what kind of framework are they gathering unto themselves? Because if they are accumulating teachers to suit their own passions, passions meaning those affections and desires that are produced by the flesh, if they are accumulating teachers to suit their passions, what is the nature of the teacher, teacher that one must find who will scratch the itch sufficiently? My God, it, it must be a teacher that has the same passions as you, right? We, they, they, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth, the, these people are teaching what they themselves are. So if you are a lover of self and want to hear about yourself and your purpose and your plans and your rights, if and when you open the scriptures, you are wholly uninterested in trying to find Jesus in the text. You just want every narrative and every illustration to be about you, the historical and theological context. That don't matter. Just preach me happy. If that's you, then you will be delighted by the preaching that fills pulpits nowadays because it is people who have a form of godliness, even devils make disciples, yikes. I mean, have you ever noticed that the ethical practices that Paul says will exist in the last days, namely lovers of self, lovers of money, lovers of pleasure, you can find a preacher for every passion. That's why Paul says in 2 Timothy 4, Verse three, he says, people will accumulate teachers that heap up teachers. They, they can accumulate because there are options. So if you, if you are a lover of self, there's a preacher for you. There are preachers with a self-centered hermeneutic who are reinforcing your innate narcissism with every so-called sermon that interprets text through the lens of self instead of Christ. Calvin said this, quote, Everyone who in his preaching, who has kindly extolled the excellence of human nature, has received great applause from almost all ages. Johnny James said, if you want to preach and bless nobody, make popularity your focus. So, so if you want to preach and bless nobody, if you want all the followers on TikTok and all the followers on Instagram, if you want to be an amazing influencer, all you have to do is preach an echo of what the world already loves, which is itself. If you are a lover of money, there's a preacher for you. There are prosperity preachers ready and willing to twist the text to accommodate your greed. And if and when this teaching is paired, with a word of faith, faith framework that says, if I name it and I claim it, I will have it. You have partnered with a doctrine that is more new age than Christian. The Bible says that the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. Am I making sense or does, it, does this just hurt? I'm just trying to understand. Okay. If, 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 that's, if the Bible says that the love of money is a, a root of all kinds of evil, 
How is it that we can listen to somebody preach health, wealth, and prosperity instead of Jesus and his kingdom and not discern that a demon might have been involved in the sermon prep? If you are a lover of pleasure, there is a preacher for you. There are plenty of preachers ready to argue that what Paul said about sexual ethics isn't really what he meant that fornication isn't actually a sin, that same-sex sex isn't a direct perversion of God's original design and the outworking of our collective idolatry, Romans 1. There are even preachers arguing for polygamy by pointing to the triune God, saying that that is evidence for why somebody can have one, two, and three spouses. These heresies exist because we have preachers who share the same spirit as Eli's sons. They are worthless priests. They are worthless priests who need deliverance. But if you are a slave to perversion yourself, then it makes sense for you to preach a perverted message. There is, in fact, a preacher for every passion. And this brings me to point number two. We don't preach to suit passions. We preach to passions, dealing with the issue of unsound teaching cannot happen primarily through intellectual instruction, as if the mind, the brain, is the only thing that's corrupted. We must also apply truth to affections. It is absolutely necessary to preach to the mind. That's why we're here, right? To instruct and train people in truth. Since even Paul instructs Timothy to follow the sound words he has heard from him and to continue in what he's taught, the scriptures present themselves as being profitable for what? For teaching, for training. We've already made the case that you can't even know God apart from God's self or a specific revelation. So the problem with itching ears is a theological problem. But as history will show you, you can know truth and still functionally believe a lie. Even now, there are articles bringing attention to the sexual abuses within a particular denomination in America where there is no lack of sound teaching. So the problem can't be that they don't know truth. The problem can't be intellect, but passion. The theology in their mind is competing with the sexual perversion in their hearts. So to say we need to preach to passions is to say that the ministry of the word must be comprehensive. We must lay claim on the mind and the affections by preaching truth to the whole person so that by the power of the spirit, we are making disciples that love the Lord their God with all of their heart and mind. Here's why this needs to happen. If people are accumulating teachers that suit their sinful passions, then one way to subvert the influence of these teachers is not by making 5,000 TikToks about Mike Todd. That ain't the way to do it, okay? That, that's not how you do the work of ministry. We have to make comprehensive disciples that know how to discern, not how to expose all the time. You understand what I'm saying? So the way you do this is by dealing directly with the affections of people who are attracted to certain teachers. Thomas Chalmers has a work called The Explosive Power of a New Affection, by which he argues that there are two ways to help somebody who has an affection, a desire for the world. The first way is to show the person the vanity of the world, the futility of the world, to preach about how some of us grew up in churches like that. All they said, the world is so stupid. It's so nasty. Oh, you want to have sex? That's so nasty. Are you sure? Are you sure? Like, they, they, they make the world sound bad, which doesn't resonate with us because the world feels good, right? So there is a, there's, a, there's a discontinuity between what they're saying and what we're experiencing. That doesn't work. In that case, we're assuming that somebody can use their reason to deliver themselves from their love of the world. And I am persuaded that that is actually one of the reasons why we have so many people in our churches who have a form of godliness, because we thought that because we got them to agree with our doctrine, it means that they were regenerated. But we know that theological assent does not necessarily mean that you actually have a new nature. Does this make sense? And so what Chalmers puts forward as an alternative is that we must preach Christ in such a way that by the mercies of God, People develop an affection for Jesus that replaces all others. 
as an example, it's the fact I got two minutes and 34 seconds. I ain't even done, but it's cool. How you gonna say like you the president? You can't tell me to take my time. You don't love yourself. You just over here making up decisions. I'm kidding. I'm probably not, but I'm kidding. Um, an example of how to do this in preaching is I'm going to preach to the passions in the room, okay? This is an example of how by the power of the spirit we can replace affections. The Bible says that in the last days, people will be lovers. And one of the principal manifestations of this love is an inordinate, unnatural love of self. I say inordinate because a natural love and honor and appreciation for what God has made would include valuing yourself. The love of self in the last days though is unnatural in that there is a centering and a loyalty to the self in the heart and in the mind and in the life that looks nothing like God. And some of the blindest lovers of self are people who go to Bible colleges, are people who exist in religious contexts because they are people who have shaped their entire life around serving people so it can be hard to see how egotistical your service might actually be. Where, where your service to others might just be service to your own self. To be a lover of self is to live in opposition to God's law. For the law and the prophets hinge on two things. To love the Lord your God with all of your heart and with all of your mind and with all of your soul and to love your neighbor as yourself. And don't get it twisted because people like to say, oh, I got to love myself to love others. No, Jesus is not saying or assuming that narcissism is a prerequisite for obedience. Jesus is assuming your human nature and how preferential your love of yourself is. Therefore, he's saying, apply that same energy to your neighbors. Does this make sense? What is helpful for you to know is how this love of self can even show up in the preachers you listen to. Maybe you like teachers who have a bent towards individualistic forms of purpose that have no sound theological basis. Maybe you prefer teachers that interpret passages with only you in mind. Maybe heresy feels more practical than holiness. And I believe that that is because of Genesis 3. There, there is something underneath all of this, something much more sinister, which is sin. Sin and therefore pride is manifesting in two ways. Pride has convinced you that you are everything which is ego. And pride also shows up as shame, which has convinced you that you are nothing. So you are constantly moving in between self-love and self-loathing. And therefore your affections, your feelings, your passions are drawn towards teaching that functions as a fig leaf. You want preachers to cover you. You want preachers to coddle you. You listen to their foolishness as a coping mechanism with your fears and your failures. And some of it is that you have believed that their flattery will restore your dignity. But in all of this, in all of this, have you ever considered the value of God and how it is only in Christ Jesus where you can be fully clothed? It is only in Christ Jesus where your sin and your shame can be removed. And that the primary reason you even exist is to know him. This God made you and unlike you, he is not self-serving but self-giving for God so loved the world that he gave. He is self-serving, self-giving to the point that he did as the song said, he came from heaven to earth to show the way from the cross to the grave with your debt to pay from the cross to the grave, from the grave to the sky. And it's by the power of the spirit that we don't lift your name or, or my name or Liberty's name on, we lift his name on high. And to this we say with the psalmist, not to us, O oh Lord, not to us, but to your name give glory. This, this at this point, at this point, watch, anybody with an uncrucified passion has now been presented with truth about their nature and about their position before God. And they have also been confronted 
with the value of Jesus. When I was living in the world and smoking all the weed and being a lesbian and watching porn and doing all this stuff, everybody told me about hell, but nobody ever presented me with the value and the beauty of God. What if, what, what if our knowledge of God and our ability to evangelize is being hindered by the fact that we don't even see him fully? We don't even have a comprehensive worship for him that is overflowing in how we communicate truth. So all we can do is rebuke because all we feel is condemnation. But what if you experience love? It would all change. See, I think the gospel has a way of saving people. If we want to preach to passions, we must preach the gospel and those who have ears to hear will find themselves not wanting to listen to teaching they used to love because the teachers they were accumulating just don't do it for them no more. Have you ever had bread? When, when you've had the bread of life, when you've had the living water, when the world offers you a lesser water, when the world offers you a lesser food because you're satisfied, you don't want it no more. And that's what we're called to do as servants of the living God is to preach the word and to preach to passions. Let's pray. God, we thank you. You are worthy of all. You are worthy of our whole heart. You are worthy of our whole mind. You are worthy of our affections. You are worthy of our speech. You are worthy of our priorities. You are worthy of our frameworks. You are worthy of our worldviews. You are worldly, worthy of what we do with our, our bodies, our hands, our eyes, our feet our mouths, our minds, our ears. And I pray, God, that do, you would do a miracle in the room. I grieve for those who have been around the preaching of the gospel their entire lives and still don't know you, still haven't experienced power, the power to live right, the power to walk right, the power to talk right. And I pray, God, that you would grant power, that you would release faith, that you would soften hardened hearts, that you would remove the veil. I pray even now, God, that in their hearts, you would say, let there be light so that they can see, that they could see Jesus, that could, they could see his glory, that they could see his reign, that they could see his kingdom. I pray, God, even in this moment, that there would be repentance that people would be willing to relinquish all for you because you are worthy. You are worthy to be praised. That your, your worth and your value surpasses all others. God, I pray those who are hesitant to repent out of fear and out of shame, I pray that they would recall the promise that you've given that all who have given up everything for you will gain so much more. God, I pray that we would see you as you are and not as people, as people have communicated you as. I pray for those in the room who do know you but are discouraged. You are a comforter. You are a paraclete. You come alongside. And so I pray even in this moment that they would experience supernatural encouragement that they would feel built up in their most holy faith. I pray for those who are suicidal in the room, God, that they would know that you see them, that you know them, that you hear their cries and you collect their tears. God, I pray that they would know that they exist for a reason, that they live for a purpose and that people around them would notice their needs, God. I pray for the leaders in the room that you would pour out humility that we would remember you, Philippians 2, that we would have the mind that you had where you did not count equality with God the thing to be grasped, but you emptied yourself, taking on the form of a servant and being found in human form. You humbled yourself to the point of death, and it was after you obeyed that you were exalted. God, we pray that we would be okay with delayed exaltation, that we would be okay with doing the work in secret and in quiet because you see us, you know us, you love us, and you hear us. I pray that we would live for you for the rest of our days. To him who was able to keep us from falling, 
and to present us faultless and blameless before his glorious presence with great joy to the only God, our Savior. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, can you join me in thanking Jackie Hill Perry for being with us today? What a, what a powerful and convicting uh, message. Thank you so much, Jackie. Hey, guys, we'll be back in here tonight as we continue our Now Love series. Pastor Jonathan will be opening God's Word for us. Be back in here, 7 o'clock, Campus Community. You guys are dismissed. <laughs>